Good morning, everyone. I would like to begin today's briefing by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting across Australia. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, and so therefore I'm on um, Wurundjeri land, and I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge that this was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. Welcome, my name is Mary Sayers and I'm Chief Executive Officer of Children and Young People with Disability Australia and I'm delighted to be facilitating uh, today's session on behalf of all the partners who are uh, presenting to you um, this information around NDIS. Today we have both captions and interpreters for the session. You can use the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen, or you can use the link in the chat to open a separate window. If you require an interpreter, we encourage you to pin the interpreters so they always show up on your screen, even uh, during the presentations. They should be on the screen next to me now, and if you can pin them by hovering over the interpreter's name, interpreter square, and clicking the three little dots and selecting pin. If you have any issues, please message um, the tech support in the chat. Make sure you're in gallery view so that you can see the interpreter and the person speaking. You can do this by hitting the button in the top right hand corner at any time during the session. So as I mentioned before, my name is Mary Sayers uh, and my pronouns are she, her. And just a visual description of me, I'm wearing a black dress with a red jacket um, and wear glasses and have blonde shoulder length hair. Um, as I said, I'm the CEO of Children and Young People with um, Disability Australia, and I'm facilitating today's session on behalf of the Coalition of Disability Representative um, and Advocacy Organisations, including Every Australian Counts. We are all very gravely concerned about the proposed method and impacts of the introduction of independent assessments to the world leading um, national disability insurance scheme, which to date has had bipartisan and community support. Thank you to the 43 MPs, senators and your staff for joining with the disability community uh, today to hear directly about these concerns. We have produced a joint statement of concern about the proposed implementation of independent assessments um, to the NDIA, which has been sent to you, and we'll also put a link now in the chat. So we've had a huge uptake today um, from all sides of federal parliament and the disability community for this briefing. You'll hear about the genuine lack of consultation, the lack, sorry, the lack of genuine consultation about the introduction of independent assessments and problems with the actual concept itself. True consultation is not when you make a decision and then present this as a fait accompli and only consult on how to implement independent assessments. It's not the genuine partnership with people with disability on which the NDIS has been built. So just in terms of housekeeping, we're recording this session, which we uploaded online later, and we're going to make this video available for people who couldn't make it today. We encourage you to keep your video on. Um, if you don't wanna be filmed, you're welcome to turn your camera off and your microphone is disenabled unless you are a speaker. As mentioned before, if you're having um, technical issues, please private message our tech support in the chat. Um, and there is also the chat function today where you can um, ask questions or make a comment. Um, we've both, uh, we have both parliamentary representatives and the disability community online today. And we know the issue of independent assessments is making people very stressed um, and anxious at the moment. And we know that people are frustrated. However, we do ask um, that we're here today to be respectful of each other and different opinions and experiences. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Named as one of the top 100 women of influence in 2009 by the Australian Financial Review, Melanie Tran, whose um, pronouns are she, her, is a designer, an innovator, and an activist and social entrepreneur. She's also the chair um, of Children and Young People with Disability Australia. So I'd like to um, introduce Mel to you now. Thank you for the introduction, Mary. It's so lovely to be here today. 
Look, Mel, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. So obviously you're a young person and a social entrepreneur. How does the NDIS help you achieve your goals? That's a great question. I think um, when I refer to my support team or the support network around me, whether that's my support waiters, my medical team or my allied health professionals, um, I see them as the engine to my car. And they are exactly the reason um, that enables me to, they enable me to focus on my goals and my aspiration as an individual, as a product designer and as a social entrepreneur, and as a chair of children and young people with Disability Australia, um, rather than focus on the challenges and the barriers that are associated with disability. But I think the biggest thing is that it's helped me balance um, the model of disability and focus less on the medical model of disability, but more on the social aspect of disability. Terrific. Thanks, Mel. And I guess if you had to summarise, from your perspective, um, what's the best thing about the NDIS? I think from my perspective, the best thing about the NDIS is the fact that it's been referred to as the greatest nation's building, so the nation's greatest building project. Um, for me personally, uh, it has given me a platform for my voice to be heard. It has given me the flexibility and the autonomy to live my life to my full potential um, with choice and control. Um, and from the perspective of the sector, it has we've all seen the shift in attitude, in perception and in culture when it comes to inclusion and diversity. And I think no matter what role you're in, every single person in this call today has witnessed firsthand just how powerful it can be when choice and control is given to individuals. Um, and, we and when we're as people with disability, when we have the power to dictate how we live our lives. Thanks, Mel. Um, and look, we'll now move on to internet. So what do, concerns do you have about a complete stranger doing a three-hour assessment on you and then this dictates your NDIS funding? To be honest, when I first found out about the independent assessments, it almost felt as if we're just grabbing a random person off the streets and then sitting down with them and then depend, we're at their mercy to, di to dictate how our lives would be or getting or being told by a stranger what we can do and what we can't do. Um, and we all know that's not true. We all know that we can own, it's the most powerful when we can tell our own stories through our own perspectives, with our own voices, um, alongside those who know us best, if this is our support team around us. And the most fascinating part, I think, Mary, is that I get to combine my own personal perspective, um, but also hear from what our community has been saying through my role as Chair of Children and Young People with Disability Australia. Um, that's it. just as an, as an example, 80% of the res respondents who participated in our recent survey had expressed some concerns um, in terms of the introduction to the, the, uh, the independent assessments. Um, and I think the four key concerns that really have stood out to me um, was the fact that Minimal activities and planning was undertaken to inform the community of the changes. Um, little consultation um, and feedback has been given from, has been taken from the community, as well as the absence of a rigorous research and evaluation process uh, before proceeding with a decision making that could ultimately change our nation and the way we receive support. Um, but I think the most important one is that the proposed reforms 
failed to properly address the underlying reasons for the scheme and it introduces an unjust and unreasonable mechanism that will limit the ability for people with disability to have a say in the decisions um, that impact our lives. Um, and again, I think the NDIS has been referred to as the nation's greatest building project. And it is our job today to protect and to build on this mission and this vision, rather than stripping back the core elements that make the NDIS so powerful and so unique. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, really appreciate your insights um, today. We'll now move on to our next speaker, um, who is Catherine McAlpine, um, who is the CEO of Inclusion Australia. Uh, so um, Catherine goes by the pronouns of she and her. And so Inclusion Australia is a national disability representative organisation for people with intellectual disability and their families. So Catherine has over 15 years experience in the not-for-profit and advocacy sectors, including leadership positions with Down Syndrome Victoria, Down Syndrome Australia, the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations and Valid. And Catherine, Catherine is also the proud mother of three sons. Her middle son has Down Syndrome. So Catherine is going to go through some of the details of the changes and, and, and the details of our concerns. So I'll hand over to you now, Catherine. Thanks, Mary. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land I am joining you today and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia on which we are all meeting. I recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people into the briefing today. I'd also like to acknowledge all the people with disability, their families and supporters for so long who advocated for so long for the wonderful social change that is the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And as CEO of Inclusion Australia, the national voice of people with intellectual disability in my, and their families, I would also like to pay particular respect to self-advocates, the people with intellectual disability who have spoken out so strongly about their experiences and the changes needed. And I'm honoured be, to be here today as a representative of the Disability Sector Peaks, the Disabled People's Organisations and Disability Representative Organisations and their many disability sector supporters and allies who all want the NDIS to achieve what we wanted it to achieve when we all came together in 2011 to say that every Australian counts. My role is to explain to you why we are also worried about the changes the Australian government wants to make to our NDIS. We call it our NDIS because in the two years between the Every Australian Counts campaign and the launch of the NDIS trial sites, people with disabilities, families, service providers and the state and territory governments worked with the Commonwealth Government to design the NDIS. Through genuine democratic consultations, the NDIS Act and NDIS rules were co-designed with people with disability having real influence. This co-design is reflected in the NDIS Act. It states people with disabilities have the right to engage as equal partners in decisions that will affect their lives. The NDIS corporate plan says, putting participants at the centre of everything we do. But in 2020, the Minister for the NDIS announced a substantial package of reforms to the NDIS following feedback collected in the Tune Review Report. The announcement said new independent assessments would be rolled out as the central source of accurate information about a person with disability support needs. Previously, the minister had discussed piloting independent assessments for people who needed extra evidence to access the scheme. But this announcement made clear that the minister was planning to introduce a new step to the NDIS process for everyone. This would not only determine eligibility, but it would also be used to formulate the budget people receive. The Minister also stated that he would ensure people with a disability have a seat at the table when it comes to implementing these reforms. However, 
as the community outcry over the following weekend, and frankly ever since has showed, there were big problems with that announcement. The government had not consulted with people with disability about this new process, what the underlying reasons for it might be, or about the solutions to these promise, these challenges. It had decided on its own solution. I want to be really clear on this point. The Tune Review did consult widely and made recommendations, but the government has reinterpreted, even misinterpreted, the Tune recommendations and ignored important details about independent assessments made by the Productivity Commission report to suit its own agenda. The Tune Review said that the NDIS should have the power to require some people in some circumstances to have an independent assessment and that this power should be discretionary. Tune did not suggest compulsory independent assessments for everyone or that they be used to determine the level of funding. The Productivity Commission did recommend that independent assessments play a role in the NDIS. However, the Productivity Commission also talked about people's concerns about independent assessments and made recommendations about what the NDIS needed to consider. This included people's aspirations and the collection of information from multiple sources. The government is changing the way the NDIS works from a person-centred approach to a one-size-fits-all model. The government has decided to use modified standardised tools, assessments of a person's function, to determine the funding that that person would receive for their support needs. And as many experts have since explained, these tools were not designed and are not recommended for this purpose. And the experience of people who have participated in the pilot has already shown that these reports can be very wrong. The government had already made the decision to use these tools without comprehensive testing on whether in fact they were accurate um, and worked for the new purpose. The pilot used as evidence was very small and was not independently evaluated. This means that the NDIS has changed the use of standard tools as well as inventing its own funding algorithm without community transparency or oversight. The immediate of outcry occurred because the government broke its fundamental promise to people with disability to engage as equal partners in decisions and at the same time decided to fundamentally change the person-centred nature of the NDIS. The mantra nothing without us about us without us is not a negotiable or a privilege. The NDIS Act, the law, acknowledges this as a right. Plus, we're all outraged because we've all been through a one-size-fits-all model before. It doesn't work. And the government would know this if they'd asked first or if they listened now. Therefore, the primary, first and primary request to our government is to stop the rollout of, of compulsory assessments and to co-design a new access and planning process with people with disability, their families, supporters, and the organisations who represent them. The announcement about independent assessments said they would provide accurate information about a person's support needs, but we do not have any evidence that they are accurate. As I said before, many experts and academics have said that the tools used in the assessments were not designed for this purpose, and they're not recommended to determine how much funding each individual needs. The government and NDIA have not told us how assessment results will be used to work out a person's budget. There has been no consultation or transparency on the formula or tool they will use to translate the result of the independent assessments to a dollar figure. We have not been told how the level of funding in a package might change. We think it's unfair that people might miss out on the NDS and not have their support needs met. We think there needs to be a strong, transparent and independent evaluation of proposed tools and metals, methods to show that they are accurate. I also like to be clear that our worries don't mean that we're against change. We know that there are problems with um, NDIS consistency and ease of access. We want the NDIS to be fair and consistent, of course. But we are seriously concerned that these changes will make things worse and not better. We are concerned that the new processes won't consider the individual needs and circumstances of people with disability and will get really important things wrong and will make it nearly impossible to change them. There is an obvious solution. The Australian government could work with people with disability families and service providers from the beginning. 
We want to make sure the NDIS is the world leading scheme we believe we can and should be. After all, it's our NDIS. It belongs to our community. We all fought hard to break to replace the old broken systems that left people with disability shut out. A critical difference is that the NDIS is individualised and personalised. Every NDIS participant should get a plan that supports their unique needs and circumstances. We do not want the NDIS to be undone in a sweeping reform, especially against the will of the people. We want the NDIS we fought for. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, uh, for that. Just a couple of questions that I wanted to pose to you. You've told us, obviously, about the problems with independent assessments. What are some of the things that people with disability are worried about? Oh, there's just an endless list of things that people are worried about. Um, and frankly, as more information has come out about how independent assessments will be conducted and used, our worries have increased. We're worried because in Assessors won't know a person or spend very long with them. They may not take into account per people's complicated lives and situations. They may even be judgmental about them. We know that many people with disability have experienced violence, abuse and neglect and exploitation. We needed to have a Royal Commission because of this. There are people who have experienced extraordinary trauma. Therefore, we're worried about that for people working with somebody they don't know well will be difficult or damaging for some people with disability. We're also worried with 60% of the NDIS being people with cognitive disabilities, that people who, there are many people who don't have anyone in their lives who can give accurate, reliable or independent backup information. Many people with disability need assessors with specialised experience and skills. We're worried that the assessors won't have the right experience or skills or training for people with invisible disabilities or complex disabilities or First Nations people or people from culturally or linguistic diverse backgrounds or LGBTQA plus people. We're worried about the cultural safety of first person people and people from core backgrounds. And that's just the start of the list. Yes, and look, and, and obviously, you know, things we've heard of around, you know, three hours, um, people can mask um, their disability for those with invisible disabilities as well. And so, um, you know, they may minimise their disability or um, an accurate picture cannot be um, achieved in um, those th that three hours. So um, that's certainly a, a widespread concern that we're hearing as well. So another critical thing that you, you may have skipped over a little bit, but I just want to explore is around the appeal rights for independent assessments. And um, what do you think this will be? Um, what impact do you think of the lack of being able to appeal um, an independent assessment um, will be for people with disability? Oh, the impact of um, not having the right to appeal an independent assessment could be really extraordinary for some people with disability. Because the government has said the results of the assessment can be challenged or appealed, and it said that even though it hasn't been able to prove that the reports and the results will be accurate. And they've also said that the decision not to grant an exemption for an independent assessment will not be a reviewable decision either. So this has enormous ramifications. So for example, an applicant will be deemed to have withdrawn their access request if they don't complete the independent assessment and they don't have an exemption. So clearly that's got enormous effects on a person. And we think this is a terrible way to make big changes. We think it's a dangerous to make big changes to the life of nearly half a million Australians of about, as I said, nearly over 60% have a cognitive disability without rigorously testing the impact using the best of our evidence available and about giving people the fundamental right to appeal the decisions that impact A, whether or not they get in the scheme and B, whether or they get adequate support from the scheme. Thanks very much, um, Catherine. Really appreciate um, you sharing that today. Look, um, we're moving on with the agenda and um, there's the opportunity to ask uh, questions and um, we haven't yet got too many questions and you're welcome to put a question in the chat. Um, but uh, while we're waiting for you to think of a question um, and also um, we'll have an opportunity for our elected officials um, at the end if they would like to provide a response um, to what they're hearing today or ask questions. So we do invite 
welcoming and welcome um, questions. But I wouldn't mind um, calling on Aaron Carpenter now, who um, has actually had an independent assessment through the pilots. And um, I'm wondering, Aaron, um, and I'm, I can see you've made a comment there, so you're there. Could you briefly tell us um, how your experience of the pilot went? Yeah, certainly. Um, so it was pretty poor from the onset. Um, I, I prefer communication via email. I received multiple text messages and phone calls. When I finally called through to the um, provider of the independent assessment, I was put on hold. I was, uh, you know, went through the, the rigmarole of listening to some really bad music, um, having to explain myself to four different people until I finally got through to somebody um, and then when I did get through to them, I was agitated by that point and asking why I was getting phone calls, et cetera. And the first thing that this person said was, can I speak to your support person? Um, at which point I kind of said, well, if you can't talk to me, then it's going to be pretty redundant because I'm going to be the one answering the questions in regards to the independent assessment. So from there, it kind of, it kind of got worse and worse. There was a lot of miscommunication via email about what tools would be used. I was directed to go and have a look at the website. When I said not all of us can access websites or, or read the information or know what those assessment tools would, would mean, I was told that was just what was on the NDIS. That was the only information I was given. Um, I was told the first name of the person that would be coming to my house um, and what time they would be coming. Uh, when they arrived, they arrived early, which... For me, is pretty catastrophic. I'm, I'm uh, autistic and I, I don't do changes in routine. Uh, so having somebody arrive 15 minutes early threw me in, in, in the uh, first place. Um, and from there, he didn't identify himself. He just told me that his name was Ben. Uh, and when I asked him what role, like what, um, what his qualification was, he told me that he was a physiotherapist. So when I questioned that and said, well, what does a physiotherapist know about neurological disorders and, and assessing it, he told me that he was also a personal care worker and knew how to take care of people and clean them. Um, you know, li li needless to say, I was concerned by this point already, but the fact of the matter is my partner and I proceeded with the assessment, um, partly because I also provide support coordination and I really wanted to see what was happening for my participants as well, what was going to happen for them as well as being a participant myself. So we proceeded with it uh, and it didn't get any better. We were told um, just to answer yes or no. My partner was told to be quiet because she was rambling. Um, my partner's also autistic. That's part of our communication probably is sometimes we do tend to ramble. Um, we're not very good at social cues or knowing when to stop or to start really. Um, but when we did answer questions, we weren't provided any context. There wasn't kind of like, you know, the context around these questions is to ask you about your neurological function or the context around this is about your mobility or how you handle situations. There was absolutely no context other than can you catch public transport would be an example. And the answer would be yes or no. And when I went into the context of I, I can, but it takes a lot of work and planning and, if something goes wrong and the bus is late, then that can be pretty catastrophic for me. That wasn't an answer that was taken um, and wasn't considered. He just went, no, well, it's yes or no. So there was no context behind my answers. He was here for a sum total of one hour and 55 minutes um, and then he was gone. Okay. And what I did ask for, I asked for the information that had been collected in that assessment so I asked for my assessment to be given to me. I was provided with the raw data for that assessment, which was um, a Hudas, a Vineland, uh, a Chief example. For, these are the examples of some of the assessments. But what I can tell you is that some of the stuff that was written in that assessment was incorrect. Either they, A, failed to capture what I had said, or B, ignored it completely. One of the biggest ones for me, and I think the most concerning for me, was self-harm it was listed as not applicable. And now I can tell you it is applicable. When I have a meltdown and I'm not coping, I hit myself, I hit walls, I headbutt walls, I tear my clothing off. And to be told that that's not 
an applicable part of your disability that you need support for just devalidates you as a person. It's, it's the word I use is dehumanizing because quite frankly, if that is not part of autism, I don't know what is for starters. And my biggest concern here is, as has already kind of been explained, if somebody has a cognitive impairment or a psychosocial disability or a neurological disorder and they're not able to communicate that issue, then this is completely not going to work for them either. I'm somebody that can articulate what was going on and, and was pretty clear with the physiotherapist, um, but they missed most of the information. What I also asked for after that, getting that information back, was what kind of draft report this would produce, uh, what kind of draft funding would this produce? And I was told, no, 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 that's not what this is about. This is about a pilot. Um, we're not providing draft reports. And I kind of said, well, thanks, but your pilot's flawed then because, A, it's not a pilot. You're already rolling it out. You've already handed out tenders. Um, and B, every single one of us that's going through this process or sitting here hearing about it wants to hear the end result. And that is what plan and what support will I get and what will that look like compared to what I have now? And the answer is you're not going to get that info. Yeah, um, and, and look, and I'm, I'm going to stop you there, Aaron, um, just in the nature of time. And I'm sorry to do this to you because what you're saying is just so um, emblematic of the multitude of problems which Catherine was talking about and giving. So I, I just really wanted to thank you for um, sharing your story because, you know, we want this NDIS to be based on the reality of people's lives. And it sounds to me like um, the situation that you were put in was both traumatising and, um, and not an accurate reflection of your life. Not at all. Yeah. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. And, and and some of your comments answer some of the questions in the chat, like who are the people who have got the qualifications to do this? Will they understand disability? And it sounds like from the experience that you went through that um, that was not the case at all. No, and, and I've got nothing against a physiotherapist doing an assessment when it's something around a mobility concern, et cetera, or if, you know, the therapist has a broad exposure to the disability community and, and an understanding of it. But, you know, we are, we are individualised and each of our presentations is unique. And if somebody has a complex presentation with multiple comorbidities, then the physio was not able to capture a fairly simple guy um, so I'd hate to, I'd be loath to see what he does with something complex. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, and look, um, if any of the um, parliamentary staff or MPs um, in, the, in the room today would like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to ask a question. <coughs> and as I said, um, there is also an opportunity um, at the end um, for you to make a comment or ask questions. Obviously, you know, our community is relying on you as lawmakers um, when the legislation comes through to fully understand the implications um, of this. So um, I haven't seen any questions come through, but please, um, you're welcome to put up your hand um, and ask any questions or make a comment um, and we'll come to you. So um, our next speaker um, is well known to the disability community and to many of you and um, he has been um, a really instrumental leader in the disability community. So I, it's my great pleasure to introduce you, you heard, um, who is the Executive Director um, of Community Connections and one of the original campaigners for the NDIS back in 2012 um, as um, an Every Australian Counts champion. And Doogie has um, gave me, given me permission because he's very passionate um, if I need to um, interrupt him and ask him a few questions. So I'm going to hand over um, to you, Doogie, by first asking um, you the question, listening to what you've heard today, how far away from the original NDIS is what is being proposed here?
thank you very much. Um, my name is Doogie Heard. Um, I want to thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm in Canberra, so I would like to pay my respects to the none of all people, pay my respects to elders past and emerging. And um, as briefly as I can, um, uh, just say a few words from my perspective. Um, I'm chief executive of uh, two NDIS registered providers, supporting over 200 people with disabilities here in the nation's capital. Um, I'm also an NDIS participant. Um, I'm a C6 quadriplegic wheelchair user following a diving accident on a Scottish beach 37 years ago, which can tell you how um, silly I can be because you Australians, who imagines here in Australia that anyone goes swimming on a Scottish beach? It's so cold. But on that day, 37 years ago, I broke my neck in two places. I'm paralyzed in all four limbs and from the chest down. I'm incontinent in bladder and bowel. I've got limited sensation below the level of my injury, which is my chest line. And this is permanent, there's no cure. The only reason I'm mentioning that here today is because the National Disability Insurance Agency already knows all this information. I gave it to them in a form that they asked me to complete, to have my doctor sign and for me to submit when I applied to become a participant on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The NDIA already knows that I'm eligible because I'm a person with a disability. They know because I'm on my second NDIS plan. Nevertheless, they still propose today that me and 432,500 other NDIS participants submit ourselves to a compulsory assessment, not an independent assessment, as something to be done by their subcontracted agents. Um, who will come to my house, prepare a report that I'll not be given and can't see. Um, I'll be given a score, a numerical score, arrived at by some random allied health professional who comes, observes me, fail to carry out simple tasks like tying my shoelaces with my paralyzed hands or not being able to make a cup of tea to confirm something that the National Disability Insurance Agency already knows. To answer your question about how far have we come from the original design con concept of imp implementation, we've come a million miles if they seriously want us to imagine we're going to agree to, that, agree to that. Very briefly, let me remind us all how we got here. Bill Shorten, you might have heard of him. In 2011-12, the newly minted Parliamentary Under Secretary for Disability in um, Julia Gillard's government asked the Productivity Commission to look at how Australia could improve its disability system. And in 2011, the PC biggest ever inquiry at that time said that Australia's disability service system was, and I quote, underfunded, unfair, fragmented and efficient, inefficient. And here's the thing that really matters when we think about what we're talking about today. The governments in Australia way back in 2011-12, all of them, federal, state and territory, accepted without question the PC um, recommendation that we needed a national disability insurance scheme. There was a cross party, no party, all party consensus that this was the reasonable and necessary thing for us to do here in Australia to make the system work. How do I know that that's true, that there was a consensus? Well, think of it in this way, because we easily forget these things. So let's think back to those days when we were building this national project. Um, I was privileged to speak at an Every Australian Counts rally in Sydney on the 30th of April 2012. Think about this consensus building we're talking about. Me, 
a raggedy ass advocate um, from Scotland originally working and living in Sydney. I was introduced to the rally by uh, its, its MC, Tim Fisher, the former National Party Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. I was speaking to an audience at that rally in Sydney of 5,000 people, including Prime Minister at the time, Julia Gillard, who was sitting next to the Coalition Premier of New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell, who were agreed that the NDIS was a good thing. And on that day, Julia Gillard said to the whole nation, I can announce that in the May budget, my government will fund our share of the launch for the launch of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And, and here's, here's the thing that we forget because we live uh, with short memories and short attention spans. Two hours later on that very same day, at the Every Australian Rally, Every Australian Counts Rally that was also going on in Perth, Tony Abbott, remember him? Leader of the coalition in the Australian par Parliament said, and I quote, I am sometimes accused of being Dr. No. When it comes to the NDIS, I am Dr. Yes. I'm going to interrupt you there, Doogie, sorry, sure. um, with your permission, um, because we want to give um, the political parties a, a bit sure. of time to respond as well. Um, but in wrapping up, what's one key message that you'd like to give to our elected representatives who are on the line today? Halt the process that's underway. Stop this without its proper consultation. Listen to people with disabilities, their families, their support providers. Continue the consensus that was started nine years ago. Build, continue to build and make better the National Disability Insurance Scheme that Australians wanted, voted for, and most importantly, all of those people in Parliament, every single member of Parliament and Senator, put down their partisan conflicts and voted to make real here in Australia. That's what we want, an NDIS that works for everyone and is working for the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doogie. Um, I could listen to, to you all day and, and, um, and I'm really um, grateful for the work you, you've done over these years, your legacy of all the people, you know, the NDIS, sits on the shoulders of all of you and, um, and you know, you are the custodians and people with disability are the custodians of our NDS. Oh, yes. So thank you. We thank have you. Um, an opportunity now and I can see that there is lots of questions from the audience members um, about questions around the whole process, which clearly shows that um, there is still um, quite a lot of concerns. But unfortunately, today, we don't have time to answer those all those questions. But we do have, um, we will, we will um, take on board all your questions and endeavour to provide information back to you. But um, there's an opportunity now for our major political parties to, um, and our crossbench um, to respond. And the first person who is going to do that um, is Steve Georgianis um, from the Australian Labor Party. So, um, Steve, I'm hoping you might be able to give us a couple of minutes in response um, to what you've heard today. Uh, I, I certainly um, uh, will give you a bit of a response, but can I just start off by acknowledging that uh, we're all gathered here today, uh, all around Australia, on um, the land of the First Nations people, and we pay our respects to those that are present, uh, the past, and of course, uh, into the future. Um, can I thank, first of all, thank, thank you for um, inviting all the members, uh, members of the House of Representatives, Senators, uh, to attend this very important virtual briefing uh, about these upcoming changes uh, that are, um, you know, to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, and, and I really appreciate hearing uh, everyone from Mary, Catherine, Aaron, Dougie, um, hearing firsthand uh, from them um, what their needs are, what they uh, see as, uh, you know, the things that are being proposed and how it'll affect them uh, and what isn't working what is working so that's really important and I thank all the participants that have um, taken part 
for raising those specific concerns um, about the decision that this uh, uh, government is trying to make to introduce the mandatory independent assessments, um, which will affect over 430,000 people receiving support currently uh, under the NDIS. Now, can I just say from the outset and from the very beginning um, that the Labor opposition, federal Labor opposition is opposing these changes. We've made that quite clear. Bill Shorten has made it clear in the media, uh, in speeches uh, to the parliament. Anthony Albanese has done so and so have I've raised it many times um, in the media and uh, in parliament when we're uh, um, putting up motions, etc. We know that you know, independent assessments, absolute radical um, change from the current system where evidence uh, from a person's uh, usually you know, uh, allied health professional um, informs decisions about the level of uh, support to a person's NDIS plan. Um, now, the government says that these independent assessments will fix consistency and fairness. That's their argument. That's what they're saying. Now, we know it's true that the NDIS um, decisions can occasionally be inconsistent. Often these decisions result in unfair outcomes. And I see people regularly that come to my electorate office um, when that some of these decisions have been made. Uh, the opposition, the federal opposition, Labor and Anthony Albanese and Bill Shorten and many experts, um, consumers, advocates uh, are very concerned. And we heard the people that spoke today are very concerned um, uh, you know, worried uh, that it'll make it harder to access the scheme um, and, and instead it'll, uh, it'll allow the government to restrict um, reasonable and necessary uh, supports to people um, on the scheme. Now we've heard from many people like uh, the, the people that we've heard you care as service providers, uh, representatives, um, that the government has not consulted, hasn't consulted before uh, announcing it was going to introduce these independent assessments. That's really important because one of the fundamental principles of the NDIS was to consult. And in this case, it's quite clear that that hasn't happened. Um, the government uh, as well is told that independent assessments will not work. Uh, yeah, the sector's made it quite clear. They've said it, we heard it today, that it just won't work and it'll create more bureaucracy um, for people and more hurdles for people to jump through um, to get to the end result. So, you know, there's what I'm hearing um, is that uh, many are fearful that it's yet just another, it's just another standardization, I suppose, um, scheme. And we heard from Aaron quite clearly, I think Aaron put it together really well. Uh, it's and, not a and, and Steve, yet. Steve, I'm going to have to interrupt you there to give um, some of our other elected officials um, a chance to ask questions because, you know, obviously we welcome that you really deeply understand the issues. Yeah. So just, th thank you Can very I just much. say very quickly that, um, you know, we're going to continue to oppose this. We're going to continue to hold the government to account um, uh, and to make sure the NDIS is properly funded, number one, um, and properly staffed, number two. And it you know, provides support that Australians with disability deserve. Thank you very much, Thank Steve, and, and really appreciate you being online. And any other MPs um, or elected officials, senators are welcome. I know we've got um, both Zali Stegel and um, Jordan Steelejohn online. And if either of you would like to make a comment or response, um, where um, Zali, you've got your hand up. So it's, um, and it can be a question. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, a definitive um, at the moment, but yeah, so I'll hand over to you, Zali. Thank you very much and thank you very much for hosting this and for the information and for everyone's contributions. We actually locally recently held a online forum on with the NDIA about these changes to try and help uh, my local community and constituents. Um, and so in during that forum, the NDIA assured me and participants um, that the additional information the additional information would be considered um, during after assessment, not just the independent assessor's information, so that a participant could bring other information. So I was really curious to know whether that was the experience of the participants in the pilot. Were they able to bring additional information? I've got Aaron shaking his head, but Catherine's probably got a good sense of the, um, the process because many organisations like ours have been deeply it, um, 
hearing what the NDI is saying and, and what's happening underneath the surface is probably a little bit different to that. So um, Aaron, unless you'd like to answer that one, you, you shook your head, um, but as well as Catherine. No, okay, it's Catherine here. I'm just looking at watching Aaron. Um, yes, the NDIS have said that um, other information uh, is a, can be available, but we haven't got any evidence that that happened in the pilot because, as Aaron said, they haven't um, shown what what the result was. So they've said they've been doing a pilot and the pilot has been, they've asked questions like, was the person polite to you? Were you? Did you feel respected? Did you feel comfortable in the appointment? And so people report similar things to Aaron. Yes, the person was nice. The person was perfectly, you know, I felt respected as a person in the meeting, but I didn't feel respected by the process. And then afterwards, I got a report that I didn't think reflected my support needs. And then I wasn't told what impact what that would have on my plan. So the real answer is we're not sure because they haven't told us what the impact on the plan on, on what the entire uh, impact on the plan will be. Um, the other and issue so is that could I ask, was Aaron yeah. able to bring further? So we it was indicated to us during the forum that um, a participant could would have to do the independent assessment that there would be flexibilities around it, but they would also be able to put forward um, the information that they maybe traditionally would have had available towards their assessment as well. Um, it was pitched, you know, I agree, different perspectives, but it was pitched that the independent assessment was to fill the gap in areas where people were not able to bring forward sufficient information for their needs. Well, that would go back to the, um, the when independent assessments were started, they talked about it being for some of the people some of the time so if people needed if people couldn't access reports then they could then they could do it so that's why in August or, or, or even earlier on when it was mentioned it was like oh well that sounds okay I'm oh, sorry not in August when the original speech was made it was like oh no that's good if they're going to pay for assessments for other people that's great but then what happened was they've said no it's for 100% of the people 100% of the time and it's going to be for your planning so we would you know I think no one's going to argue on the issue of equity I think the issue is that we were not consulted on the solutions and one of the obvious solutions that was never trialed was just pay for the pay for your your local reports you know just pay for the existing you know here's a standard report go go to your local GP or go to your local allied health people and get the report from them that's never been tried and the NDIS could pay for it that's never been trialed yeah, as, an and as an alternative solution. And I'm going to stop you there, Catherine, because um, and give Aaron an opportunity to answer. But certainly the notion that an independent assessment will then dictate your budget is very clear. So, um, Aaron, in answer to that question, were you asked for any information, other additional information? No, and I offered it. So I, I did mention some of the things that had been. So I guess this was a little bit, you know, duplicitous of me when I found out that I was going to, well, when I volunteered to do the um, independent assessments, I also had my own functional capacity assessment done by an independent OT um, because I wanted to compare apples and oranges, I suppose. So I already had that functional capacity assessment done by an OT to go back to and go, okay, so I can look at how those two things stack up. Um, when I suggested, you know, what, what do you do? Do you want to talk to my treating psychologist, my support workers, um, my OT in regards to some of the information you might want to get? He said, no, it's not relevant. We'll just do it here and now. Um, and even things like the context that I have five people in my home with autism. Um, obviously, that has an impact on every single one of us is, is a little bit different. Um, I was told that the assessment was about me and no one else in the house even though that's an environmental factor, obviously. So I would say that the answer for me personally, in my experience is no, they don't want to hear about anything else. And look, there's been a, a comment in the um, chat from Fiona Shark, who represents the Autism Alliance. And um, many participants have asked if an independent assessment could be done by a practitioner or a professional who knows them well, who knows their story, who knows their disability, who knows their environment and, the flat out refusal of that has happened. So, um, yeah, so I guess that, um, you know, that ability to deeply know a person is being completely minimised through this process. I'm just wondering, Zali, did you have any follow up questions? And um, I know Gordon has got some questions as well. No, that's 
that's interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, and Jordan, did you have um, any questions or comments that you wanted to add? And Jordan Steele John um, is very well known to people in the disability community, so probably needs no introduction. Just wanted to check, is Jordan still on the line? I know he had a question. He may have needed to drop off. Was there any other um, comments or questions um, from any of our elected officials that they'd like to make? We haven't heard anyone um, from the um, coalition. Welcome for you to ask questions of anyone um, who's on, on as well. Okay, well, there's, if there's no further questions, um, we might wrap it up because we're nearly up to our hour. Um, I'd really like to thank all our speakers today. I'd like to thank, uh, thank um, Mel, Aaron and Doogie who are um, NDIS participants and who have really um, shed a lot of light on, on this and what it's going to mean in your lives. Also like to thank Catherine um, and also like to thank um, all the parliamentary um, staff. We know there's a lot of um, MPs, senators and staff online and also everyone from the disability community. And for the parliamentary staff, um, just to let you know that Catherine and I, along with other um, representatives, will be in Canberra next week on the 17th and 18th. And we'd welcome um, the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one conversations if you would like more information. Um, and you can contact um, info at everyaustraliancounts.com.au.